Our final topic of this series is hybrid machine learning models, or how we can connect the quantum and classical worlds together. So we know how to train classical computers. Uh, the tools of deep learning have really given us lots of power. We also know how to train quantum computers, and in fact, it's usually the exact same tools we can use. So because of that, why can't we put them both together and have the best of both worlds? So let's motivate uh, hybrid models a little bit. Classical computers are very, very good at certain things. They're, they've been highly optimized over more than 50 years for certain tasks. You know, running code is, is very easy these days. On the other hand, quantum computers are still able to do something that classical computers are not able to do based on this fundamental property of interfering complex amplitudes in a very large vector space. Um, that means that they can evaluate certain hard functions that a classical computer won't be able to evaluate. So we can motivate hybrid models by saying, let's, let's take a particular problem and divide the labor. Let's let each model specialize in the things that it in particular is best at and do the heavy lifting at the things that it is best at and let the other component of the computation handle everything else. So, Quantum variational circuits are, in a sense, already hybrid models. And you, you might see in the literature people calling these hybrid models. So quantum computer will first have the task of computing samples efficiently from some hard probability distribution. And then the classical computer is responsible for doing something with that and uh, also to make that possible. So the quantum computer is doing something very particular and the classical computer is really aiding it in that process. So everything from downloading data, loading data, um, feeding it into the controller of the quantum computer, and then aggregating the measurements, averaging them, running the classical optimization loop, potentially communicating with the remote server. This is all done by the classical computer. But I would still say that that's not really a very hybrid uh, hybrid model, right? So it's, it's a hybrid computation for sure, but it's not necessarily a hybrid model. And the reason is that the classical computer is largely uh, passive in this process. It doesn't have any flexibility in its computation. There's no free parameters in the classical part of the computation in this vision of a variational circuit. So what, what happens if we then actually add classical pr parameters and classical modeling capabilities into the classical step of a hybrid circuit or a hybrid computation, right? And it, we can really take this idea uh, as far as we like. If you know that a variational circuit is a single unit, it's a particular way of uh, evaluating hard expressions. And you know that classical computers are very good at classical machine learning and we know how to train them then why can't we combine these two things together? Why can't we have large hybrid models that have many quantum and classical components that are both optimizable and end-to-end -end trainable throughout the entire computation? That's really the, the vision that I want to push. I think hybrid models are sometimes over undersold. I think they can actually do a lot more than we're currently doing with them. So in order to understand how to fit these two pieces together, it's important to think about how classical machine learning software works. And typically what's done is a, you can think of a computation being broken down into atomic steps. And the dependencies of these steps is depicted in a graph-like structure called the computational graph. So every node in this graph is one of the steps. It could be a particular function and the data flow is indicated by arrows between these nodes or edges on the graph. And famously, the software library TensorFlow, at least earlier versions, and the, the library Theano uh, use this computational graph approach very directly. So what's important about the computational graph is that for each node, we need to have two ingredients. So we not only need to know what is the function being executed on that node, but also, what is the derivative of this function? Or more generally, what is the Jacobian of this function? So if it's a multiple input, multiple output function. And then we create the, the, the computational graph by composing these individual steps together. 
And then the gradient can be computed by using the chain rule, which again is just a, a multiplication of those individual derivatives. And how this is done in classical machine learning libraries is something called the backpropagation algorithm. And the basic idea of backpropagation is you run through your computation once in the forward mode or the forward pass. So this is going through each step in order. And then at each step, you actually store the result. This is important for later. And then when you want to compute the gradient, you need to actually go through that entire computational graph again, but in reverse. This is called the backward pass. And the reason you go in reverse is it's something called reverse mode automatic differentiation. It just happens to be a, a smart way to do things when you have a scalar cost function as the output. So there's no hard requirement that you go reverse, but it's convenient. And then in order to compute the gradient of the overall function, you compute the gradient at each node that you hit, and you feed it those values that you saved from the original forward pass. So the gradient itself will be a function, and you need to evaluate that function at a particular point. And the point you evaluated at should be the value you saved from that forward pass. And you accumulate, accumulate this full model or full computations gradient using the chain rule. So unfortunately, backpropagation does not work inside a quantum computer. And then the main reason for this is that we can't store quantum information at the intermediate steps of a quantum computation like we, we need for backprop. And the reason is because, uh, well, it would be prohibitively large to store that because every state might be exponential in the number of qubits, and we have to store many states, intermediate states. And also the no-cloning theorem says you can't simultaneously store a state and then still use it for computation. So once you've evolved that state forward, you can't recover it again. Uh, there is an exception here. You can use backprop on simulators. You can't use it in actual quantum computers, but you can use it in simulated quantum computers. So that's a, that's a barrier, but it's not a fundamental barrier. Uh, it means we can't apply the backpropagation algorithm inside a quantum circuit, but it, it doesn't mean we can't apply it past one. We can't say, let's go through a quantum circuit and just treat a quantum circuit as a basic atomic individual step in the computational graph. So the expectation value of a quantum circuit is actually a differentiable function. So if we treat that single expectation value as a single step, uh, we can use the parameter shift rule to determine the gradient of that same function, which means that we can feed that to the backprop algorithm. Uh, I like to use the, this abstract notion of a, a quantum node, and it emphasizes the, the nature that a quantum computation, a variational circuit, is just another node in a computational graph. It's just another step. And if you picture it that way, then you can interface very nicely with classical machine learning software and automatic differentiation software. So how this works in practice is your software framework of choice, be it TensorFlow, NumPy, PyTorch, it is some sort of native tensor or array objects. What you need to do is you need to peek into that object and extract the numerical value. You need to run your quantum circuit based on those parameter values. And when you're computing the gradient, you'll need to run the parameter shift rule to evaluate the gradient. So the Q node is basically like a class or an object that has two functions that you can call on it. And then once it's been called, you can then convert that result back to uh, the native tensor object of the library and then register the gradient function with that library so it knows how to compute backpropagation over that step. And that's how you integrate quantum computations with existing machine learning libraries. And this process is end-to-end -end differentiable. So this allows us to make very, very richly, arbitrarily complex uh, hybrid computational graphs that are end-to-end -end differentiable. So the quantum gradients are computed analytically. Uh, so this means I'm using the parameter shift rule. I can, I can do that either on hardware or on simulator. But the overall model just looks like a computational graph to the machine learning library. And it doesn't, it doesn't ever know that it's interfacing with a quantum computer. And what I've depicted here, the red arrows are the kind of forward pass steps in a quantum computation or in a hybrid computation. The yellow boxes are classical steps, the green boxes are quantum steps. And so you can evaluate this larger hybrid model by running all those steps along that graph and then computing the final output. And you can compute the gradients by following the blue arrows, 
which needs you to compute the derivatives of the output of a box with respect to the input of that box. And we know how to do that for quantum circuits or quantum nodes using the parameter shift rule. So it all works seamlessly end to end. As an example, uh, there's this notion of transfer learning from deep learning where you, you train a neural network and then you kind of chop off part of it and you reuse it for different tasks. So you might have trained it on a, a very big data set like ImageNet, which has billion, millions of images. And then you say, well, if I chop off the last couple layers of that machine learning model, then it should have very good, nice representations of images that are still not specialized towards predicting the things for ImageNet, but are more general uh, features of, of what are important in images. So then you can retrain that on a different data set uh, with new trainable end to it, where you've frozen the, the part that you borrowed from the original network. So this is cool because it allows us to apply transfer learning to now quantum systems. We can take a pre-trained classical model and then add on some classical and quantum trainable steps afterwards and see if it still works. And it turns out that it does work. You can take a features extracted from a, a ResNet model, for instance, uh, in this particular example, it's to predict ants versus bees in images. And you can run it through a quantum computer uh, or a hybrid model and still the predictions can be, can be made with good accuracy. So I'm not saying that this is actually demonstrating any sort of power of quantum computations. It just shows that everything still works. You can connect quantum and classical resources together for pretty nice looking uh, structured hybrid models and it's end-to-end -end differentiable. Another cool thing that this perspective allows you to do is hybrid models that have multiple different types of quantum devices in them. So it could be two quantum devices that are sitting in different dilution refrigerators or quantum circuits that are actually executed on completely different physical platforms like superconductors and photonics. And you can again stitch those together into a larger computation. And there's actually an example we have in the uh, Penny Lane website where we stitch together a computation that is running both on a, uh, a qubit circuit like a superconductor and a photonic circuit. And we're looking at the, the difference of those outputs and we want to make them as similar as possible. So really hybrid models, the, the idea I want to push here is that um, quantum circuits are trainable and they can be seen as just another step in a larger hybrid computation and we can make them end-to-end -end differentiable and train the whole pipeline end-to-end -end with machine learning tools, which is, is really exciting and I think will be really the basis for a lot of uh, interesting developments in the future.